The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the third age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose above the great mountainous island of Tremalkin. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the wheel of time. But it was a beginning. One and two and three and four and... Hello and welcome to Raise a Glass, the podcast where we talk about the stories and storytellers that shape us. I am Hunter Danson. My name is Eric Lintola. And my name is Jordan Kirkpatrick. And we are very excited uh, to be talking about the Wheel of Time. Woo! Before we get there, we wanted to do a land acknowledgement because at the time of recording, it is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, I am on land that belonged to the uh, Mohegan tribe. And we are on land that belonged to the Seneca Nation, known as the Great Hill People and Keepers of the Western Door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Before we get into our discussion about Wheel of Time, I have to know what's in your glass, Eric. Well, it just so happens, Hunter, that the what's in my glass um, was brought today by my very, very good friend, Jordan Kirkpatrick, who I'm so excited for everybody to get to know and uh, excited to hear his thoughts. Uh, as we've discussed many times about <laughs> one of our shared loves, the Wheel of Time. So I'll pass it on to you, Jordan. What is in our glass today? Well, first, thanks, Eric and Hunter, for having me on the podcast. I'm thrilled to be here to talk about The Wheel of Time, one of my uh, all-time favorite works of fiction. Um, so wow, what's in my glass, and our, both of our glasses, actually, is uh, an Oban 14 scotch from the highlands of Scotland. Um, it's just a beautiful uh, tasting scotch mm. that... Uh, I actually just received as a birthday present a couple months ago. I, mm. Do I get hints of maple syrup? It's like, it's, there is a hint of maple syrup in there. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. It's del- it's a delicious. It's one of my favorite scotches for sure. Wow. This is the first time I've ever been able to smell something and know, like, like oh, I smell that. I'm really proud of you. You've made it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm if I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite book series, I definitely need to pair it with one of my favorite drinks mm. of all time, too. Yeah. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, wow. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Glad you like it. Mm. Feel it right there in the chest. I love it. Can I have some? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try to pour it, but I think uh, it might hurt my computer in the process. Yeah. So, Hunter, I got to know what's in your glass tonight. Oh, thank you. I have something much less... Uh, impressive, I guess. But uh, it's a Meguiar's Stout from Aldi, Ooh. which is, Ooh. I'm pretty sure, is like just off-brand Guinness. It just it looks like Guinness in the store, <laughs> and as many Aldi <laughs> products look like something else. Um, mm-hmm. I won't say it's as good as Guinness, but it's you know, it's not bad. It's a good fall drink. Nice stout. Mm. Fall beer is the best beer. I would contest that, but You'd be yeah, wrong. we don't have time, so. <clears throat> but I'm right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we have one other thing that we do before we start uh, on raise glass, and we uh, raise our glass to something during the week, and we pour it out for something during the week. So uh, I'll, I'll ask, ask Eric what he's raising and pouring for. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm raising a glass to time spent with family. Um, it's been, I feel like a few weeks since um, 
my wife and I got to spend time not only with our kid as the three of us, but with her extended, kind of her immediate family. And so we've got to do that like three or four times in the last few days. Hmm. Um, and it's just been fun. Um, just came back from a JV football match, uh, f- football game, not match. Football players don't play matches. Wrong sport. Wrong sport. Wrong football. Yeah, yeah wrong pitch. <laughs> Uh, um, and that my brother-in-law was coaching. Um, and so that was fun. And it's just went uh, and hung out outside, you know, I had some fall time this, this, this past weekend. So that was really nice. Uh, so I'm raising a glass to family and I am pouring one out for cubicles. Um, and I very specifically mean a, a group of cubicles. They knew who they are, um, that I have now moved three or four times, <laughs> Um, in two different jobs that I've had, um, that's how much these things have passed, have like followed me around. Um, and I think I moved the parts of the cubicles for the last time today. Um, at least the last time for the next year. And I'm hoping to put them up tomorrow, um, for, for my coworkers. Um, I'm just sick of them. Uh, mm. They've taken too much of my strength and energy and willpower. <laughs> you better knock on wood yeah. when you're saying you think you're done. <laughs> Those cubicles are coming back. That right? is probably true. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jordan, what are, what are you raising and pouring one out for? Uh, so, I would, I'm raising my glass and pouring one out for the same thing, and that is... Uh, my baseball team, the Baltimore Orioles, at the time of recording, mm-hmm. um, they are they're down two games to none in the American League Divisional Series in a best of five series. It's not looking very good, but uh, you know who knows? You know the, they might have come back by the time this you know the, the podcast is released. <laughs> but more likely than not, the <laughs> season will have ended, and so I'll pour one out for that. But then at the same time. This is the first year that they've really been a good team uh, in the last six or seven years, and they've been doing it all with like really fun young players, and it feels mm-hmm. like the beginning of a window um, that they have to really contend for a World Series title. And it's just been a really fun group of players to watch this season, and I'm I'm really proud. They kind of had a worst-to-first uh, oh, cool. approach this year, and they've really done some damage. And um so that that's been really fun. So I'm kind of raising a glass to their success this year while also mourning that it might be coming to a close here. <laughs> nice. So. How many of the games do you watch? Like, I've 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 like love I, I used to love baseball and I've had issues in the last few years of just trying to like stay up you know, with the pace of you don't tune in for all 162. Games. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I I only watch a handful of games of y- a year, but for the first time this year I purchased Major League Baseball releases a radio package. Oh, and you can pay $4 a month and listen to as many games as you want. So it's very old school. I'm like mm. down in the basement, you know, at my workbench listening to a baseball game trying to fix something. Nice. It's uh yeah, it's very 1950s. <laughs> put the I, dial right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Great. I got the rabbit ears yeah. pointed in the right yeah. direction. So I, I listened to, I don't know, three or four games a, a week uh, oh, wow, this, that's this awesome. year, yeah. you know, and I didn't listen to the whole game and I, I'd be doing something else, mm-hmm. but um, I did listen to a lot of the games this season. So that's fine. That's nice. really funny. Only $4 a month. It feels. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I, it's, it was like a buck a game for me, yeah. you know, or mm-hmm. like a dollar fifty a game to listen to. So, yeah. you know, whatever. It's nice. Fun. Hunter, how about you? Um, I'm I'm raising a glass to the uh, Connecticut Trolley Museum, um, which we went to with my son uh, and my daughter, and we uh, got a pumpkin. You can take a ride on an actual working trolley, mm-hmm. um, and the one that we were on, I believe, was like the second one that they got. It's one of the oldest ones. Um, and it's at least, it was at least like running as a trolley in the 1930s. Um, and it had a lot of the original glass. They have like the advertisements on the side, um, (laughs) which are really fun to look at. I, I took a picture of one. I don't know 
if you can see this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> That's a box card children. I wow. guess. Here. Yeah. Uh and it's <laughs> it's an advertisement for fireproof polisher F Y R P R U F. Polishes quickly, cannot explode. <laughs> <laughs> What I like out of my all of my products. Next furnace is bright yeah. and clean, um, but it's just they have all these old trolleys. It's it's so nice. My my son is so excited to to ride on a trolley. We have a membership now, um, mm. and and you you ride on the trolley and go out into a pumpkin patch and get a pumpkin and decorate it. And that's adorable. it was a great time. Um, and I'm pouring one out. <laughs> Uh, this might be maybe too heavy, but I don't know. Just war, um, yeah. mm. with the news yeah. coming from Israel and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, yeah, because I think like before the war in Ukraine, and I'm just speaking for my my own mental state. I I thought I was at a point where like. Like, I know that we have lots of violence still going on, but before the war in Ukraine, I thought that, like, the idea of, of a country declaring war on another country, that was, like, you know, with the way that modern warfare is, that was not going to happen anymore, and mm. here we are. Um, and it's, you can't really pour out enough. Um, yeah. yeah. Wheel of time turns <laughs> and turns. And with that, <laughs> we're so bad at transitions on this podcast. At least I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to go to the wheel of time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I I'm not sh quite sure how this is going to go because it's Eric's favorite series of all time. So... Mm -hmm. I I have read the first three books, and I've just started the fourth one, and I've seen the TV show, um, and I know you, Jordan, uh, mentioned it's you know it's one of your favorite series of all time as well. So I feel like I'm just gonna be asking questions, trying to <laughs> listen and and understand, and try and get more out of how it's shaped you guys, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about myself, but. Um, Mainly, I think I'm going to be interviewing. Um, but we are going to start with the first three books, right? Mainly. Mm -hmm. um, yep. We have lots of spoilers on this podcast. Um, so many spoilers. Yeah, I, I, it's really hard to talk about art and how it has shaped you without spoiling it. Um, we will do our best in this episode not to spoil too many things from future books in this series, even though there will be some kind of arcs talked about. And from we'll do some um, hypothetical hyp hyp hypothesizing of what season three of the show might include, maybe towards the end, but most of it's going to be focused on the first three books um, with those who've re uh, watched the show, um, maybe even a little bit bigger focus in the first couple, because um, that's where a lot of the 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 meat of the show is taken from. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get into that, I I just wanted to share one of, I feel like one of the reasons that we've kind of connected, one of the first ways that we connected uh, when we met, which was uh, a while ago now. I have, I have no idea, actually. Or a we number met. of years. A number of years. Indeterminate yes. number of years. <laughs> was the Wheel of Time. Yeah. Like, that was a, like... It sure was. Back when we didn't even really know each other, like, like oh, yeah, Jordan, like, we have yep. time. Like, that's... Mm. Yep, and I recall, you know, hanging out in groups, because um, my wife was friends with you and, you know, a bunch of your friends before I knew you or I knew any of you. And I remember being invited to, you know, group get-togethers, and somehow at every single one, you and I ended up in a corner by ourselves <laughs> talking about Wheel of Time while everyone else was playing board games or 
doing things that normal people do at parties, but somehow you and I are just talking about our favorite characters and our favorite mm. scenes from the mm. Wheel of Time. Well, and that has launched like a pretty good friendship. Yeah. And like really yeah. COVID. Like we <laughs> yeah. were talking one day and we're like, hey, what if we just like started a book club? Like, and it was about Wheel of Time. About Wheel of Time. Yeah. And because of that, we had a year-long book club where we not only discussed all 14 books of Wheel of Time and the start of the first season of the show, but also like five or six other. Yeah. It was like really well-known fantasy and sci-fi pieces that were have shaped our culture. Mm. Yeah. So when we talk about, you know, you know, the art, the stories that shape us, um, the Wheel of Time in, in a lot of ways, you know, and, and we can go back and kind of talk about how it first came into our lives um, before we knew each other. But that, that book club and reading through the wheel of time during, you know, kind of some dark times Mm -hmm. of of COVID and, you know, pandemic uh, shutdowns and separations and and smaller social circles that, that book club and just really discussing the wheel of time and going through those characters and those those stories. um, It really did. It helped a lot at a time in which Crazy. so much of the country and so much of the world was dealing with loneliness. Mm-hmm. I wasn't dealing with loneliness because yeah. I, I had my book club. I had the Wheel of Time. You I know? mean, we it's went like, on some walks because cause we didn't oh, live yeah. too far away from each other. I remember being in my back backyard with yep. the apartment I was in talking about that. Yep. And some discussions. And you're, yeah. Mm. Huh. And, and honestly, parts of that are what prompted me to talk more with Hunter about doing a podcast <laughs> about books. Like it, it, it also worked that way. Um, I, I, Cause these are conversations I love and yeah. doing them with people that I want to spend time with. Like mm. let's, let's make them happen. Uh, Can you give a, um, as succinct as possible overview of wheel of time? For people who might not know what it is. Do you want to start it? Try it or you want me to? That's a tall task, uh, Hunter, to summarize a 14-book <laughs> series with a prequel. But it's true. Who do you think who has a better shot at being succinct? You or, you or me? Do you, want, you want one of us to try and then the other one to <laughs> try and compare? <laughs> I was just thinking the main piece of Wheel of Time is the way in which it's the world is set. Yeah. So like, the main piece of the Wheel of Time is in the name. And that it's true. Yeah. So this, the wheel of time, true to its name is kind of rooted in more of like an Eastern philosophy, Eastern tradition in which, um, time and the world itself operates in more of a cyclical pattern rather than the linear, uh, timeline as we kind of understand it in the West in which every person, every soul is intrinsically tied to the wheel of time and then gets gets spun out, re-entered into the world through like a reincarnation um, over and over again. So there were, you know, there are no beginnings to the wheel of time and there are endings to the wheel of time. It's like a, an often repeated mantra um, in, in the story. And so as, as part of this world in the fantasy series, there are two kind of antithetical beings, the dark one and the creator. Um, and they are kind of fighting this proxy war throughout all of eternity against one another. And they both have heroes that get kind of reincarnated and spun out into the world to fight this proxy battle over and over and over again. And so this story told in the wheel of time is one iteration of that proxy battle Mm. effectively. And it follows one character whose name is Randolph Thor, who is, the champion of the creator, uh, also known as the dragon or the dragon reborn. And so we follow his journey as he transitions from being a, you know, a shepherd, just a, mm-hmm. a, a sheep herder and this kind of backwards rural t- small town to learning of his destiny, fighting it, embracing it, and then leaning into it um, as he hmm. seeks to resist the dark one over the course of the entire series. Mm. That was amazing. How did we do? Pretty good. Succinct? 
Yeah. Okay. If you want, it's a saint. You were the right one to choose. It. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking when you said leaning into it, I was thinking about my favorite moment in the entire series. Oh, yes. Uh, we'll get there. Yeah. I, yeah. We'll it'll there. be a few, few, yeah. uh, few books away, but yeah. that moment just, I go to it. Okay. Um, that was really well done. And that was a really good way of communicating it without giving away really what happens in the story. Because while the story focuses on Rand, there are so many other characters, yes. some of whom are, I would argue by the end of the series, as important as Rand. Or if not as important, then as close to equally important as he is um, throughout the series. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, you know, the story of, you know, a chosen one being rising up to fight the powers of darkness is kind of a tale as old as time, right? So mm-hmm. this is a, a an arc that existed before the Wheel of Time. We go back to, you know, Joseph Campbell and the hero cycle. Like, this is something that has existed before the Wheel of Time that Robert Jordan adopted and adapted for his story. But mm-hmm. where he really excels and where he really differentiates the series is, like Eric said, it's in the ensemble cast of characters that exist in the story and the different threads of the story that there's so many now it's it's incredible in the way they they interact yeah so if you want to dive into a series that will keep you enthralled um at least in the last hundred pages of every book um and bring you up on this journey uh it is worth it if you're sick of reading books that you finish and you're like well i wish there was more the Wheel of Time is the <laughs> best series for you. There is always more. <laughs> and when you finish, you can go back and reread them and you will see new things. In fact, yeah. I, I think I've, I've read through the series three times now. I think you're more than that. Uh, I w- I've done three full rereads, but then I'm also very guilty of, on occasion, I'll just pick up a random book because I'm thinking about a specific scene and I'll read mm. this, you know, the second half of that book or I'll pick up one chapter, start reading it and decide, you know what, I need to read a couple chapters before this for context and I'll go back and then I'll keep reading. So, uh, you know, I, it's, it's hard to really gauge how much, but yeah. I, so you were making me think as you just shared that. One of the ways that this book series has shaped me is I've always been an avid lover of reading, and I'll, I'll share a little bit later about kind of when I was introduced to this, but I distinctly remember um, grad school started, and I'd lost my love for reading. Mm-hmm. College kind of took it out of me because I had to do all this reading um, that I didn't choose. And I was trying to remind myself in grad school that I I love reading. I was like, yo, like, you love doing this. Like, you should lean into it. And so I think that was my first reread. So second read of the series. I I think I did in like three months. I just started at the beginning and just tore through it. it, And and it it really pushed me to then just love reading again. Because I was like, this is is where I can come back to. I know I'm going to love it. And it's going to move me and push me back into something that really is a, a defining piece of, of, of my identity, not the most important thing by, by any means, but a big, big identifying piece for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you read the whole series in three months, there's someone somewhere who can put together a quick calculation of how many words you read <laughs> per, <laughs> per day, per hour, per minute. And we'll see if you did and literally anything else with your time. Yeah, I don't remember months. doing but anything if you, were, with the... if you were looking for something to get you back into reading, you found the right story, in, in my opinion. <laughs> so what was uh, First Contact? Do you want to go for it? Sure. Yeah, sure. So for me, um, I kind of had a roundabout way into it. From So I, you know, had a love for kind of gateway level fantasy growing up, you know, Chronicles of Narnia, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. Those were three series that I just kept reading. I'd finish it and then I would start it over again and read it again. Um, and then in middle school, I think I must have been in eighth grade. So that was 2002, 2003, something like that. Um I actually, someone made reference to it on a video game that I was playing at the time. And I was like, wait, there's another fantasy series out there. I thought I had read them all. I love that. (laughs) And I, so I didn't really know anything about it. I picked up the first book, loved it, read it, 
And, you know, I would have to check the dates, but at the time, only books one through 10 had been released, but I didn't know that this was, you know, this was early days of the internet. You know, I didn't, I Google was, you know, just becoming a real thing. And so I was just, I'd plow through each book. I'd go to the library, I'd get the next book. And then the 10th book ended and Eric, I'm, I don't know if you recall, but the way the 10th book ends, but it ends on a cliffhanger. But I didn't know that wasn't the last book. It was just the last book that had been released. So I finished this book and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And then I, I think I did end up figuring out, oh, Robert Jordan is still working on book 11. And so that was, that was first contact for me. So it's just kind of a funny anecdote about how I didn't realize the series wasn't finished. And then you know, at that point I was hooked. I was going back and I was, you know, reading books over again, reading the series. I joined, there was an online message board called mm. wildmania.com where I spent way too much time uh, when I was you know, 14 years old, <laughs> but I just developed a love for the series from that point on. Sorry, I had to do a quick... You had a oh, refresher on how book on, 10 ends. Yeah, yeah. Ends. yeah. It, was, it was a tough place to be when you're... <laughs> Yeah, and you're thinking that you're gonna about to read the end of the series. Mm-hmm. Very confusing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, where's the last battle? Like, I thought, <laughs> yeah, like, what? <laughs> we're talking about the last battle. There was no battle. Yeah, why? Well, Maybe yeah. But you uh, were big and you were heavily involved in that. Yeah, yeah. It was a big place where people would post their theories about what was going to happen, and Robert Jordan leaned heavily into foreshadowing, and oh, uh, he yeah. changed some things because of it. I'm sorry. Didn't he change some things because of? Them? Oh yeah, there's there's some spoilers that could be dropped in which Robert Jordan seriously he did alter some character arcs because the fans had figured it out, uh-huh. um, which is kind of a controversial decision in my mind. And you know, I mm-hmm. go back and forth on whether that was the right thing to do. But yeah, I think the TV show is gonna keep some of it. Keep some of it, but I think they're gonna revert some of it. Yeah, that's Back. what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 that's what I meant by yeah. That. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Black Tower. Yeah, that's yep. what I'm thinking about. Um, so, Eric, yeah. first contact for you. First contact for me. Um, I am trying to remember which birthday it was. I think it was my 13th birthday, but it might have been my 10th. I think it was my 13th. I it was a big birthday for me. I got Star Wars Monopoly. Awesome. Um, I got an Eric Carl book that at the end told me I was getting a dog. Oh. And I got a book. Hmm. Um. Safe to say, I did not read the book for the first many months, six to nine months after getting it, because I got a dog. <laughs> and yeah. got a board game that was probably the most played board game that I had up until the end of high school. I played mm-hmm. Star Wars Monopoly dozens upon dozens of times. Um, but then I finally picked up it was, it was this version of it. My mom was working in libraries at the time, and so she you know, got the nice plastic over it, so... This is one of the few that hasn't gotten destroyed by me, even though it's been read many, many times. And I just loved it. And strangely enough, my interaction with Wheel of Time throughout middle school, high school, would be me reading one to two or three books in like a weekend or a week, and then not touching it for months, and then getting the next one and just mm-hmm. devouring it. Like there was a... a a, a nice comfy chair in my room for a while. I don't know why. Um, and I remember distinctly one like week of vacation, like just sitting in that chair and being like yelled at to come down for food. <laughs> like, no, I'm reading, I'm reading the book real time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and yeah. And so that was, I, I think I, I, and then I, I, it, I think I started middle school and I don't think I finished it until my freshman year of college. Um, and I, I was always just behind when, the, like, I finished, I finished the 14th book, I think, a year or two after it came out. So it wasn't, it wasn't right behind, but it was pretty, pretty close, right? I, yeah. I, I never knew that it wasn't done because I never hit that point. Right. Because I was never reading straight through. Yeah. Um, and I remember the moment I finished the series... It was late at night, like, um, I was back from college at my parents' house, and I just walked down the stairs, and, or maybe, I think it was, yeah, I walked down the stairs just dejected. It was like, 
walked out and like I don't know what to do. Yeah. Like this book is this book series been with me for ten years or some some amount of time that like I, I could define an entire stage of my life by this book series. And so in my in my existential crisis of a moment, and I say that kind of jokingly, but also like pretty I mean, it's true. I tried to start writing my own fantasy series and just like envision things. That one didn't pan out to anything. But um yeah, that was that was my first read. That was my first contact of yeah. it. And I'm glad you made the point about when you finished it too, because I had kind of the same reaction. So, you know, like I already said, I think I picked up the eye of the world when I was twelve years old. And then the last book came out when I was 22 years old. So those are mm. extremely formative years mm. in a person's life. And um, you, you meet, you join up with the characters in the first book when they're, you know, 15, 16. And, mm -hmm. you know, every 12 year old thinks that they're as mature as a 15 or 16 year old. So yeah. I, you know, I was Randolph Thor. I was uh, Matt Cawthon. You know, I just put myself in the shoes of these characters, especially in the early, earlier books, mm -hmm. um, when it feels like more, more adventure fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, so I really felt like I grew up with these characters. Um, and, you know, the teenage years, they can be tough. Middle school can be a tough time. But so, so it feels like you have these friends that you're growing up with um, throughout. And then mm -hmm. when it does finally end, you know, for me, that journey was 10 years from, from initiation to completion. And you do feel like you lose something. I mean, yeah, you have them. You can always go back to the books, but it does feel like you want to always know what comes next for those characters. You always mm -hmm. want to know where they go next, what comes next in their mm -hmm. stories. Um, and that's, I think is a beautiful thing when, um, when you feel that strongly about a series at its completion. Mm -hmm. I sometimes I maybe not even sometimes I often when I'm discussing Wheel of Time wish I could go back to the first read yeah. like read it without with completely fresh eyes not knowing the story yeah um, I know I would interact with it different it probably wouldn't be my favorite series because it doesn't have the emotive like this is like my life mm -hmm. but I think it would still be one of my favorite series um, actually I, I've met two people that have finished the series who didn't like it. I don't understand why anybody would finish the series, <laughs> <laughs> but would keep reading a book series if they didn't like it, unless they were forced to along the way. Um, uh, that's, but, a, that's a 14 books is a big commitment yeah, for something and, you don't like. And the last three yeah. books are so good. They are. That I just, I remember asking like, why? But why? Yeah. Like, so Hunter, I do want to ask you, uh, as you know, Eric and I kind of talked about you know, first contact for us and how the journey we, we went on uh, with the books, but you're in the process of reading it now. Yeah. So what does that journey look like for you? Um, I don't want to uh, uh, disappoint fans of Wheel of Time, so I'll try and be careful. But my first time reading it, I read it, picked up the first one from the library um, because one of my best friends said it was their favorite book series of all time <laughs> and i was uh, you know had, had written a fantasy book and was sort of starting to think about publishing so i was like i better know what's out there you know this is a pretty big one so better read it and and i think that's part of like how i read the book because i read it critically as someone who mm. was thinking about publishing and you know when I when I read now, like there are things I just sort of read for fun, but when I read now, I also read to like learn, like like technique and like research and that kind of thing. And Robert Jordan's prose, I and I was I was going through a phase where I was really like focused on prose and really trying to cut my own prose down and and mm -hmm. build it back up. And um, <clears throat> Robert Jordan's prose is. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's good. It tells the story. Um, 
but it's very there's a lot of overstatement and restatement and um i could only like when i was reading the first book i wrote a review of it that i'm not going to link because it was way too salty and written by a much younger man um <laughs> and but i you know i i still think i i agree with my points i just wish i hadn't put them so uh <laughs> negatively but I mean, it wasn't that negative but I've come around because I, I've mentioned before how I've had a hard time with Brandon Sanderson. Like I can, I can, I've never finished a Brandon Sanderson book. I've tried it. I just, I just don't really, I mean, part of it's the prose and part of it is, is the things that I read now and who I am now as a, you know, almost 30 year old man. Um, but Part of uh, in Struck in White's Elements of Style, there's a, a section about overstatement, and he talks about how, you know, unless unless your idea is actually, um, is actually that powerful, is actually something that is really important and really good and and like, you know, worth telling and worth putting in these terms, then then don't overstate it, and. It took me three and a half books to realize that, like, the threads that Robert Jordan is weaving are that powerful. Like, they they do have the power that he he sort of he's just he he comes off to me when I'm reading him as like as as very sincere, <laughs> and but he's just like so excited about the story that he just like <laughs> he's just like getting it all out there, and I'm like. Robert, just slow down, man. Like, I'm getting it. I'm with you. I'm here. Like, you don't have to like hit me with with all the exposition and everything. And um, and so so I, I've I've come around. I like I like Jordan better than than reading Sanderson because I feel like Sanderson is just like very woodenly describing the magic systems and things, whereas Jordan seems a lot more sincere to me. Which is, admittedly, I haven't read enough Sanderson to really like. <laughs> but I, I I started liking it in the in you know after three and a half books. Are you in the Isle Waste? Huh? Are you in the Isle Waste at this point? Um, I just started book four, uh, so so not yet, not, not yet. yet. Okay. Yeah, I think you'll quite enjoy that. Yeah. Um, and. It was the scene, I specifically remember the scene where I started like, it's like, okay, I could actually finish this book series. Um, and it was the, it was just like when Egwin and Nynaeve and Elaine are in the tower and they're talking with Varen um, Sedai. And uh, Varen is, is of the brown Aja and, and they're talking about all these like prophecies and they're going through all these dusty tomes and things like that. And I was like, you know, there's always a part of me that just wants to be in some castle looking through dusty tomes. <laughs> um, and this, you know, it delivers. And and um, even though I feel like, you know, the threads that Jordan weaves come out as kind of loose sometimes with all the plot things. And it's just so complex. Um, like, he, he delivers climaxes. And from what I've heard of the end, like... You know, I guess he didn't technically finish it, but he he delivers at the end. Like his story is worth hearing. Um, that I I talked a lot longer than I planned to, but um. <laughs> well, I think your the the points that you made that were um, critical of the story those are fair, and I I think I agree with a lot of them too. If you're looking for somebody to really model, you know, prose after and really tell like you know kind of a succinct story and get to the point robert jordan might not be your guy <laughs> <laughs> yep he he wrote 14 books and if you know for anyone listening who's not familiar with the series you know fans lovingly refer to books seven through ten as the, the slog. slog uh and you know it's you know i still really appreciate those books and mm -hmm. love them because of the 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 depth of the stories mm -hmm. and the, the all of the characters and the subplots, but there is there is a certain point where um, 
like you said, Robert Jordan just got so invested in the characters and got so excited about his story that he might have lost kind of the main plot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he and, meanders. Yeah, he I'm a meanderer, weird. and I love that. Yeah, I love it, like the side trails. But it it, it the series could be ten books without losing many things. Yes, mm-hmm. and you know, and fast we could save this discussion for when we get to the show, but that gives me hope for an adaptation that is intended to go eight seasons, about 14 books. There's a whole lot of subplots that don't necessarily need to be adapted. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I think I agree with you about, you know, the prose not being the strongest part of the series where I think he excels is in weaving a story. Mm -hmm. I don't really even think of him as an extremely talented writer per se, but I think of Robert Jordan as an extremely talented storyteller. Mm. I would sit down and listen to him talk. I would. His character arcs are also, I I love. Yes. Because they're always interacting with each other. And and you can even see that in the first couple books with when are people together? When are they not? When do they come back together? How do they then leave each other? What are the emotions that they're feeling towards each other when they leave? Right. Book three, like, Wait, why are you going to Two Rivers? What are you going to do there? How does that? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And I think also, too, the the series is kind of, it it can be broken down into a series of trilogies. Mm -hmm. Right? And, you know, I I recognize that 14 is not a multiple of three. But (laughs) the first three books could be viewed through the lens of being uh, a self-contained mini trilogy within the series, in my opinion. And Eric, maybe you disagree. Mm. The first three books read more like adventure, adventure fantasy. If you've read other works in the genre, you know, kind of like a little bit more, uh, you know, like the hero cycle, like I mentioned earlier, or uh, some Terry Brooks um, sort of Shannara or, Mm. uh, you know, kind of stories like that where, you know, the, the the shepherd realizes he has this great destiny mm-hmm. and he's whisked away by some older you know mentor who's going to teach him the ways star wars of, of, yeah yep star wars exactly <laughs> the first three books really kind of follow those tropes and it at times can feel derivative although although i think it's unique enough to still that was another of the thing like a sticking point for me with the first book was the derivative parts cuz i'm a, i'm a huge tolkien fan Mm-hmm. And so they came off to me not as like loving so much as derivative, but Robert Jordan definitely takes his own way with it eventually. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when I mentioned that could be broken down into trilogies, I think the second trilogy in the series is the strongest books, four, five, and six um, really are what make the wheel of time mm. stand apart in my opinion mm. as um, as one of the, you know, as a titan in the genre, just because of the way the world expands, the characters diverge and the different subplots and really, ju- really just where Robert Jordan goes with the story is unlike anything else I've read in the genre. Um, and I think that at least at the time it was, and I think there have been other authors who have tried to emulate it since but where's to what book is to my as well six okay that scene came off to me as somebody who has not read um song of ice and fire or seen really spent any time watching the show but has only kind of heard of it that to me read as much more of like a the red wedding or like that type of like absolutely it just changes everything yeah yeah, I agree. It has that kind of like pivotal moment feel to it in which um, everything is going to be different after that moment. This is the conclusion to book six. And, you know, the Red Wedding in, you know, the Martin universe, it almost felt like more like a gut punch because you weren't, there was nothing really leading up to it. You weren't expecting it. It was so out of nowhere that it, to me, it didn't feel like the climax of a, a growing plot. It just felt like 
I got cold clocked out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Whereas okay. the the conclusion to six, it has the same vibe where you know immediately okay. afterward everything is going to be different, everything's going to be changed. But in six, there's a a clear crescendo of the tension of the you know three or four interweaving storylines leading up to that up to that scene up to that moment um and and that i think is is one of the best examples of robert jordan's storytelling and why i like it so much mm. and it comes to the climax I, you you brought mm. it up hunter and that's probably the piece that i think jordan does better than any other fantasy author i've read um like he his last hundred to 100 pages, 200 pages in every book is almost always the best 100 to 200 pages in the book. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. You get there, you, once you hit the, that concluding arc, like you don't put the book down unless you need to go to the bathroom or you fall asleep while reading it. <laughs> if I could make a, a, a very loose analogy, um, I like certain kinds of jazz. <laughs> I like jazz that has a point. Um, Jazz that just doesn't go anywhere. Um, That is just kind of like playing around and and it just, it doesn't, it builds and then it goes back down and builds again, builds back down. Um, It it doesn't do much for me because I I want there to be like a statement. And I, I realize that that's not necessarily the point of jazz a lot of the time, but it doesn't really speak to me as much. But I think if you're telling a story, like, you know, it, sometimes you tell a story just to tell a story, but other times you tell a story to to make a point, to say something that you can't say any other way. And I feel like Robert Jordan, he writes very long jazz songs that may, in the beginning, make you feel like, oh, this isn't going any- anywhere, but... But it does. It gets there. He layers yeah. it. Yeah. And I think that is both. I, so I think you're absolutely right. And I think that is, it can be considered both the strength and a weakness of his storytelling abilities that, especially in the books, you know, that are referred to as the slog <laughs> there in the middle, um, you'll have entire chapters, plot lines that you just feel stuck on, that you, that you're reading and you're wondering, you know, okay, this is, this is cool, but where is this going? What's Mm -hmm. the point of this? And you might not get a payoff for Mm -hmm. that for two, three books. (laughs) And that is, I think really impressive one (laughs) that he can set up a storyline like that and still tie it all together. But then at the same time, you know, we we live in a, a world in which pe- your readers might not always have the patience for that. They might want to, you know, jump to other books, other interests, um, or really, you know, you could also, you know, if, from a more critical lens, make the argument that it shouldn't take two or three books to, to get to the point sometimes. Someone could say that. I still appreciate the journey, not necessarily the, mm-hmm. you know, the destination, but as long as it's going somewhere, I'm still a fan of it. But yeah. I, I rereading the series, I will still reread book seven to 10. Yeah. I, I won't skip them. Certain characters, I might be like, Oh, I don't really remember you. And I remember why I don't remember you. And so I might re- <laughs> read their parts a little bit faster. Why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of eyes to die that, all have the similar sounding <laughs> aren't <names>. really necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, but like, yeah. But but then he p- p- brings them together, and and he even does that with some of his more important characters. Like, let's think about Tom, Tom mm-hmm. Marilyn, who was like in the show at the in the book at the very beginning. Yep, and then disappears. Yep, and then shows back up and kind of like does that a few different times. Yep. And yet he's a pretty important character to the he is to the story, and you see a small interaction that he has with a particular character mm-hmm. towards the beginning that like you learn why three books later, yeah, he had that interaction and be based off a relationship with a different character, <laughs> and it's when you catch those moments as a reader. 
you feel really proud of yourself too. <laughs> Cause if you, if you're paying attention in this series, you'll, you'll get those moments even on a reread and a third read, if not even more because of the layers that he ends up delivering on. Mm. Again, maybe not everybody enjoys that or wants to go into it. Um, and I think I, I've, I've at one point read the actual numbers or was reading, looking at a chart of the actual numbers of words spent on different things. Mm-hmm. And I think if you were t- to remove Robert Jordan's communication about clothing, you would remove an entire book. <laughs> um, I think it's an entire book's worth of words. Yeah. And yeah. for a TV show, that works. Right? We already saw Rand in the second season of the TV show wears a shirt that comes directly. Was it from a memory of life? Yeah. Do you remember this shirt? Oh, uh, yeah. Like, they... Yeah. There's certain parts of that that are really kind of... aren't great for the reading. That's true. But for creating a world that they can then replicate in a show, become invaluable. That's true. <laughs> because he's built it out for them. Yeah, that is... <laughs> that's one of the, you know lighthearted knocks on Robert Jordan's writing is that in any scene you immediately know one, what everyone is wearing. (laughs) You always know immediately what everyone is wearing. (laughs) And, you know, how important is that? Maybe not that important, but Mm -hmm. like Eric said, you know, you might spend a couple paragraphs on that every chapter about what everyone's wearing for a TV adaptation, it's, you know, it helps guide the adaptation, but then at the same time, you don't need to spend a couple minutes of screen time communicating that. It's just immediately apparent as they are going about their, mm. about their time. So that is one thing that I think can be, is, is made more succinct by a different medium, for sure. Mm. Andrew, you brought up Brandon Sanderson earlier. Um, and I quite enjoy Brandon Sanderson. We've I've, we've talked about Brandon Sanderson on this podcast. I talk about the difference between a three course meal and a dessert. I think Brandon Sanderson is dessert. I love dessert. I can only eat so much dessert at a time before I then need to go and take a break and come back to it. I'm I'm working through my third Sanderson book of the year, and will soon start my fourth. Um, and so, like, I love Sanderson. Um, Sanderson tells you everything. Like there's less for you as a reader. You don't need to be thinking Mm -hmm. because Sanderson will tell you everything. Robert Jordan does not tell you everything, but he's a little, a lot closer to that than, than I know your writing in center is. (laughs) Um, There are very distinct cultures and groups of people throughout the wheel of time that are, connected more based off geography and have cultures based off geography and certain landmarks than they are connected through language or through even a past history. And it's not like, Hey, this is like, we've, we've existed as the United States of America for hundreds or thousands of years. It's, there's this huge thing that happened, the breaking of the world and everybody was shifted and where they landed that region impacted their yeah like who they became and you see that in unique cultures that develop you see a difference between Falm and Kyrian the game of houses mm-hmm. and Kyrian looks very different than where the Sanchin are from and that's very different from the Ayo Waste which is very different from mm-hmm. the Spine of the World you know yeah and, and that's a really kind of fun thing and there's almost things he doesn't need to communicate because of that. Like you learn very quickly that part of at least the men's view from Iman's field or the two rivers has to do with chivalry in a very like Western medieval sense. Um, 
And that is not the case at all in the IEL ways. And a large part of that is how the cultures developed based off of the land where they lived. And Brand, Matt, and Paringit made fun of that unceasingly. <laughs> it's a great that. comedic effect. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not really sure where I was going with that. I feel like I... I think you're talking about the world building. I think the world building that Robert Jordan does is is really um, matched only by uh, Tolkien and its creativity, but I think he surpasses Tolkien in its his level his level of detail that he gives to each uh, individual nation um, and each indi- unique culture that you're exposed to throughout the series. Like I'm a Tolkien man first and foremost, so I can you know see the storm in, in Hunter's head right now as I say <laughs> that the world building might eclipse that of Tolkien, and so I'm a, don't don't hear what I'm not saying here. Tolkien did it first, and he did it best. But the level of detail that Robert Jordan is able to go into about uh, you know the process of succession in in Andor. Um, mm. in Camelin or like the game of houses in Kyrian and you know what the culture is like in the Aiel waste between the different clans and the different sets that's a level of detail that you don't really get in any other fantasy series I've never seen that anywhere else you even, feel like the world is real and it could exist and it, even the different views and, and this is going to talk about something that you haven't really interacted with but not giving away too much the different views of men and women who can channel yeah and like there's the different cultures have very distinct views you've seen that in the Sianchen versus like the the white tower right mm-hmm. the way that women who can channel are in the white tower the leaders of the world and in the Sianchen the lowest slaves of all and he keeps adding other ways that different cultures that have been created will then view women who can channel differently yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great example of different cultures view the same thing in different ways. I would say that, um, I would say Tolkien's world building is ultimately deeper for me, just because in terms of the, you know, to- they're not interested in the same details. Tolkien is very interested in the language and he has built these cultures and he knows the history of how their languages have changed over time, which is something that is like just a, such a deep level of world building that maybe only matters to Tolkien um, ultimately in terms of just like, you know, you don't have to know much about the languages to read the story. What I will say that Robert Jordan brings is diversity um he has a lot of eastern influence um and you know Tolkien's world is is very i mean by design it's based on like english culture his his whole idea was to give in to give england its own mythology um with lord of the rings and <laughs> he basically did that um <clears throat> but robert jordan you know he has different races uh, with with different skin colors. And I don't know about the discrepancies between like, you know, what the skin color of the Seon Chan is supposed to be. So that's one of the biggest interesting things, actually. Uh, Just sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Like because of the breaking of the world, people weren't divided. Most people weren't divided based off skin color. In fact, the the one exact, like the one derivation to that rule I think it's the only one, right? Is the Aiel. For whatever reason, the people that you'd least expect in the desert. Yeah. Uh, white white people with red hair are, are in the desert. And so that's why that's what a, one of the things I was trying to get at earlier, the cultures, is the cultures aren't based off race or religion. They're based off of proximity in their own part of the world. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah. So I guess I, I, I mean, I'm only on book three, so 
take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but I, I interpret Jordan's world building as like more broad, like there's a lot more of it um, than there is with Tolkien, but I don't think you can match like the depth of Tolkien. Um, Tolkien takes a very academic approach and yeah, Jordan takes a very storytelling approach. And I, I think that that's a very different thing. I also, I will not fight against Tolkien at any point. <laughs> I think Tolkien is, Tolkien yeah. has really shaped all three of us. It's yeah. Um, and yet you need to go really deep into random Tolkien mythology to understand more of the world. And you don't need to do that in Wheel of Time. It's kind of all encapsulated in one series versus these unfinished tales over there that actually are important, you know, and then, hey, wait, let's read the Silmarillion, which just really starts just as a theology textbook and then becomes, you know, a an old history and philosophy <laughs> over time. Yeah, I see what you mean. Like you with with, you know, Tolkien's universe, you're to learn more about the universe, you're reading notes he wrote on the back of napkins that his son, you know, edited and put together and <laughs> that adds so much rit- richness and depth. Mm-hmm. Like I the 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 stories from of the Noldor and the First Age are some of like I I still like think about those in the middle I'll be, you know, at work think and then all of a sudden I'll think about uh the fall of Gondolin for no literally no reason <laughs> whatsoever. Uh and so the richest the richness that you get there is is incredible and I guess the difference in the point that you're making, Eric, is that Robert Jordan weaves all of that in to the main body of the main series that he has. Whereas for Tolkien, it was just kind of more of like a passion project. Like he had this universe that he loved and he just kept like writing more and oh, characters changed the more he wrote about them and he would, you know, kind of develop them um, over time, regardless of whether he ever published it or not. That wasn't his priority. He mm-hmm. just, he just loved it. Mm-hmm. I do think that like the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings can all be read with no with, like zero knowledge because they were actually you know he had a publisher who like gave him feedback, um, mm-hmm. but I don't want to make this about like Tolkien versus Jordan. That's not where I want to go. Oh, I don't think that's a really controversial go. opinion here. Um, Damn. Okay. Because it's not. Yes. It's, it's different. They're different. Yeah. Well, so like, so. It's like Jordan Tolkien wouldn't shapes exist Jordan. Tolkien. Yeah. Right. So this Absolutely. is a, you stand on the shoulders of those who come before you. And, and no matter what type of art or science or mathematics or economics, whatever sphere you were in, whether or not you it's clear, I mean, everybody, every modern fantasy writer has read Tolkien. Mm-hmm. But even if they did not, by reading other fantasy authors, you have been shaped by Tolkien. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Tolkien was incredibly shaped by Beowulf. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the idea of the ring. Like, um, uh, the, 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 the Hobbit that like, came from Beowulf. Um, it's like you step on the, you, you stand on the shoulders of those who come before you. Um, and so it's, it's fun then to see the beginning of the eye of the world after the prologue. Um, which is just epic. Sorry, the prologue of Eye of the World is just completely different from the first chapter. You mm-hmm. start in one world and you end up in another. So you, you end up, first chapter, you then meet a, a prototype character, right? When then a Gandalf-type witch comes to the town and this fellowship is gathered together. Right. And that's the journey that starts, which is why you could view of it as derivative. Um, and then all of a sudden, as the series progresses, they become their own very unique characters where their past has shaped every aspect of who they are. Just think about Rand later on in the lists of people that go through his head. Yeah. And like those names wouldn't go through his head without having grown up in the two rivers. Like if he grew up in the Iowa Waste, they're not, th- he's not thinking about those. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. So, so do you guys have any favorite scenes from the first three books? 
Def- yeah, definitely. <laughs> many, many scenes. I, I have a quick answer to it. Um, hey, you go right ahead. And I'll just then, start yeah. with, with that. It, it'll be from the first book. Um, and, and I'll probably share maybe a couple more from books two and three. But my f- favorite scene of the first book actually didn't even make its way into the TV show, which I was really heartbroken about. But, you know, I, I understood why they made the decision. Mm-hmm. Um, Rand is in um, Camelin pretty early on in the first book. Well, Part of the way through, halfway through the book, I don't know. Yeah, um, he's in Camelin. Uh, Matt's going a little crazy because of the dagger. Um, they've met Loyal at that point. They're staying at the Queen's Blessing, and he goes out in the town wearing the wrong color, or wearing this like I'm telling way too much information. Well, it's Robert Jordan. <laughs> you got to tell yeah. about the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's that. Come on, Hunter. You, you What's everybody real wearing? Time Eric? fans want to know what was Rand <laughs> wearing. <laughs> okay, Hunter. I as you were talking about Robert Jordan and the way you're talking, he just wants you to know all the things and all the energy. Uh, all I could think of was, oh, my my best friend is currently describing me <laughs> and <laughs> what I would be like if I wrote a book series because that is exactly the level of energy that I have, have had when I've discussed with Hunter a book series that I was writing um, <laughs> that hasn't taken a lot of fruition in the, near, in the recent past, but it was that level of exuberance. Um, but Rand is in the city of Camelin and is trying to see Loghain, um, the false dragon, being paraded. Um, and he climbs up on this wall to get a better view of him. Right? That's accurately what happens, right, in this scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and falls over, well, he falls off a tree over a wall. And lands in a garden, beautiful garden, near a pond. Oh, yeah. And that is where he meets... Elaine oh. and Gawain, right. um, the daughter heir, and what is Gawain's official role at that time? It's just the brother. Right? Yeah, and her brother, um, who controversially for me in my first two reads of this show was one of my book was one of my favorite characters. Mm, that's uh, a bad take. Yep. Yeah. Uh, third read, not not <laughs> as much, um, but. Falls over the wall and interacts with them and just and meets Galad. Um, and th- this whole interaction of these four characters, all of whom are important to the books, I just found, I, I loved it. Because it was the moment where the shepherd boy meets the queen. And like, there's a realization that something's going to come as a, as a reader that they actually, they catch. Like, they, they, they kind of get it. And, and it's... It's that idea that he is to Varen, that this wheel bends itself around him. When he is in a, in a space, you know, what normally would happen changes to push him forward in this time timeline um, or this wheel. And I, I remember the moment where, you know, he, he had one of those random things he made to buy the red cloth instead of the white cloth. Um, because it was cheaper when he walked in the city and everybody had a cloth around their sword and he was trying to hide that it was heron, his had a heron mark on it, like ended up paying off because that meant that he was a true queen's man. Um, <laughs> and then he meets the queen and this, and her Aes Sedai advisor, that's a whole thing that happens there. But then it comes out that he has a heron branded sword in front of the queen and everybody goes up in arms, which is also like one of the first times when you really realize the impact of the Herod brand. Like you get it from Alan Mandragoran yes. or from Lan, but like that's every, all of the queen's guards immediately go into a defensive posture as when they realize, Oh, this man is, is a threat. This is not just a shepherd. This he's hit. He has a Heron Mark sword. We need to protect the queen. Mm-hmm. Which the irony is that Rand has never he doesn't know how to use this. Yeah. Sword. He would he'd just as soon stab himself as actually mm-hmm. be able to take on any of the guardsmen. But just the presence of the Heron Mark sword. Yeah. That's everyone on alert. Yes. And like then later on you realize, like later on in the series, which has already been shown in the in the TV show, you learn that Loghain had seen Rand on the wall and like knew at that moment that he was 
the Dragon Reborn. Mm-hmm. And that's already come out in the show at a different timeline. Yeah. Um, but like, it just starts with a tumble. And it just starts in a funny moment. And it just, that interaction ends up being something I really like. Because I really like a lot of those characters. And they have some really interesting storylines. Some of which I don't think the show will bring out. Um, but it, it's just such a fun start for me mm-hmm. when I think of, of, of the first book and, and what ends up happening in the show, not the show, the book series. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that, that scene too. That would definitely be in the, in the top three in the book for sure, but I'll go in a different direction for the eye of the world. My favorite scene or sequence, I guess you would say is a little bit before that. It's when the party, out of necessity, ventures into the city of Shadar Logoth mm-hmm. as a means of escaping the Trolloc horde that is chasing them. Um, they know that the Trollocs won't follow them into this abandoned, forsaken city, and so they go in there out of necessity um, in search of shelter, in search of safety. Yeah. And reading that sequence reads like a horror scene in a way that is kind of unique to that scene because that's not really a a theme or a tone that Robert Jordan writes in throughout the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. At least I can't think of many examples, maybe a couple where he gets close later in the later books. Um, But that, that sequence is one in which is really gripping throughout Mm -hmm from when they first enter into the city and everyone is on edge and Moraine and Lan are really the only ones who know what to expect. And so they tell everyone to be on their guard and you know, you get this creepy feeling. It's creepy. The entire time yeah. they're there. And then of course the farm boys go out and venture on their own. They disregard the, uh, the Aya Sedai who told them don't go anywhere. And, you know, took. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. You know, they, have this moment that is you know you could say it's mm-hmm. um you know stereotypical in a story like that where they were just like yeah what does she know she doesn't know any better i'm gonna go see what's going on out in this cool city yep. i've never been in a city before <laughs> and that's where they run into the character of Mordeth, who mm-hmm. is able to pass through a wall mm-hmm. uh and they re- they encounter this kind of un inexplicable and really kind of irresistible evil at the same time. Matt finds the dagger that ends mm-hmm. up becoming a really important part of the story throughout the rest of the series. And it all kind of traces back to this one scene, this one sequence. And then of course the Trollocs end up following them into the city and Maureen and Lan oh, speculate sorry. on what could have driven them into the city because Trollocs wouldn't willingly go in there. And then they all have to flee and be separated. And that that sequence from start to finish, from when they decide to go in to when they uh, end up fleeing, has a, a real Minds of Moria vibe, you know, mm-hmm. to go back to and make another a Tolkien comparison where just out of necessity, they have to make this really unsafe and unwise choice. And they just hope that it's going to be okay. And then it's not okay. Mm-hmm. And throughout that entire sequence, I, I found myself on the first read and then on all the subsequent rereads, not being able to put the book down. Mm-hmm. Um, the ways might throughout. be the only thing I could think of. That's like the ways are creepy, yeah. Really creepy. Yeah. But like they also are related. That, that is true. Uh, they are in a, in a way. Hunter, how about you? You've read the first book. You've read the first three. What you, is there a uh, scene that comes to you? The climax, which I know is a, you know, it's the first read for me, so I'm still just kind of like absorbing it all for the first mm-hmm. time. Um, and I think that was the moment where I was like, I didn't like it that much, you know. <laughs> but then I read the climax and I was like, all right, I'll read the second one. Um, <laughs> because that was the moment where I started to to kind of realize that the force of Robert Jordan's vision was was worth pursuing uh Mm. and and worth worth reading for um just because the the imagery that he uses like i don't even remember all the details because i was so caught up in it um i just remember like rand like teleporting 
and you know sending oh. his huge shockwave of power and then he like cuts the yeah. threads behind the dark one or something of like these threads that are going all the way back through the different lives and the threads of the wheel of time that the that have been weaving and he cuts them and it's just like it's like you know what man this is the old, this is like this is why you write <laughs> yeah. like you like the the show climax was so disappointing and like yeah. honestly they couldn't do that they couldn't do the imagery that he's talking about like how, how do you even depict the threads of the wheel of time co- coming out of the back of the dark one that Rand can sever like you, you can't do that in a tv show um at least especially in the first season if yeah. they did that in the first season there would have been nowhere for Rand to go yeah um so that Sorry. I thought that was awesome uh, and and really really fun to read and um, yeah and it was it was worth it was worth six hundred pages of build up <clears throat> yeah um, what about book two Eric book two I think of a couple scenes they're related um, and they also don't come out in the show. So book two starts with Rand doing sword practice Mm -hmm. with Lan on top of um, Feldara. Feldara. And then Lan like walks him through how to approach the Amaralyn seat, which is just an epic scene. But it pays off at the very end of the book when he, it it is, it is Turok in the book, right? In Mm -hmm. addition to, okay. When he's, Face to face with Turok in the city of Falm. And Turok says, Let's see what it takes to earn a you know a heron branded sword on this side of, of the ocean. Mm-hmm. And and he said that in the TV show. And at that point I was like, Belly, that's a direct quote. <laughs> and what they do in the in the in the book, there's then this really cool fight that like really Rand shouldn't have won. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At at all. Um, but he ends up winning it, which has implications later on for like having a heron mark sword. But in the TV show, they just like skip it. They have a very Indiana Jones moment with the, because he never learned how to sword fight. He never learned how. Yeah. And, and, and I share that as like one of my favorite moments. I'm I'm expecting one of you is going to talk about Egwene and her character development in, or that that would be in the top three. Okay, because that's that might be the best actual. I might talk about it. Okay, that that's a piece that sticks out to me. I really enjoyed that kind of the way you see that start at the very beginning of the book, and then it ends. I mean, it ends ultimately in the sky, in a way that again the book the TV yeah. show didn't do. Um, but the sword fighting, and, and that's that's something that's, I feel like in a lot of approaches to fantasy, if there's a witch or a wizard, they don't need a sword. And like I said, I don't learn how to use swords because they don't need them. They have the power, the one power. But the sword is such a crucial part, and like physical weapons are such a crucial part of Rand's development as a character. That I'm really, I really appreciate that they kept those for, um, like in the, in the books as a way to even ground it in reality as a reader, and to see his physical growth and improvement. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so Hunter, I'll leave the Egwene scene to you. But so for me, the other of my top three scenes in uh in the great hunt would be the moment when matt blows blows the horn of the leer mm. and summons the heroes of the horn back to fight for the light against an army of the sean chan so this is a you know all part of the same sequence you know all three of these scenes that we're talking about are all you know the climax of of the book and in this moment uh there is an army of the sean chan that look ready to take out Rand, mm-hmm. Matt, Perrin, and their band of Shinaran soldiers. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of this moment where all hope is lost. They're not sure what to do, but they do have the Horn of the Lear. And it's this mythical artifact 
that they don't even know if it's going to work. They don't know what's really going to happen, but they know that they don't really have any other chance. And so Matt, of course, is the one who actually blows the horn. It wouldn't work any other way. I wouldn't have it any. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, that is, it. that's the way that it really needed to go. He needed to be the horn blower, and the heroes of of the horn, the heroes of ages past, of different turnings of the wheel. These, you know, kind of uh, uh, special, you know, champions of the light. You know, we talked earlier about how different souls are reincarnated and kind of spun out into the world over and over again. There are some. I don't know that the count, maybe a dozen, two dozen souls that are tied to this horn that can be summoned at will by someone who blows the horn. And Matt blows it at this like great moment of need and they come and they fight alongside our heroes, our characters, in order to defeat the Shanshian army that had otherwise just slaughtered an army of white cloaks and mm-hmm. looked invincible at that moment. And so I just love that moment when Matt kind of, he gets to be somebody leading up to that moment. He was kind of a, he was a, a dull character at mm-hmm. best, uh, and had shades of evil or, um, moodiness, I guess. I'd say that moody, was yeah. t- tied to like the angsty. dagger. Angsty. Yeah, almost like yeah. Cross. yeah. And it, but it was unpleasant to read, <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. And so he finally had a moment where you're like, Oh, Heck yeah. Like he's, he's doing something. And that was really a a pivotal moment for him where he, he gains a lot of momentum as a character, but also one of the unsung moments in that scene is when the heroes of the horn show up and, and Rand has spent the entire book trying to deny his destiny are refusing to believe that he is in fact Mm -hmm. the dragon reborn that he 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 refuses to accept that he is Luz Theron uh, reincarnated, and then all of the heroes of the Horn show up and start calling him Luz Theron <laughs> and start calling him Dragon. And at that moment, as a reader, like as a reader, right, you 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 kind of know, all right, this guy is the chosen one. Otherwise, I wouldn't be reading this book. Mm-hmm. But just to hear it echoed from these heroes of this of the Horn, these mythical figures, is is really just a cool moment and a validation where Rand has to, he has no choice. He has to accept his destiny. And it happens right there in that moment. Mm. And that's, I really like that part of it. Good choice. And so I, I hope I, um, I have to apologize to fans because my memory of book two is mixed together with what I've just watched in the show. Cause I listened to book two, mm. uh, it must have been a couple of years ago now. Um, but the one thing I remember is uh, like, like the biggest part that sticks out to me is the whole sequence with the Seon Chan where um, Egwene and Elaine and Nynaeve are abducted um, and they are collared by this army that uses uh women who can channel as slaves um with these they use these collars and just just Egwene is collared Egwene is collared okay yeah okay see that's so why just, my mind is so yeah yeah i remember like elaine and nynaeve were there so they were there yeah they, they try to they spend the next few chapters trying to rescue yeah the, the, okay. the tv show actually did a really good job of depicting that yeah, oh, yeah, entire like pretty accurately the entire too. sequence. Yep, that was pretty faithful. It's just brutal, like because Egwene, you know, she has to be quote unquote broken by her her master. There's there she Egwene wears the collar, and then there's a specific woman who is bound to her, who you know uses her in battle, um, uses her power. But before she can be used, she has to be like made aware that she is she is a slave now and she has to be obedient and so like she cannot touch things that um she considers to be a weapon and so one of the first things she has to do is pour her captor a cup of water and she views the pitcher of water as a as a weapon 
um, and so she can't touch it for a while. And um, is that is it also a pitcher of water in the book too, or is it something else? I'm with you by memory of this. The sequence is is colored slightly by yeah the the recency. We, of we have to talk show. about that. Yeah, maybe a, 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 after you're done with this peak, because that Egwene's whole thing in this season two is just yeah, it's the best part. Yeah. Of the show. Yeah. Yeah. And like, cause she, she needs, she needed it. And I remember, you know, I thought she needed it in the book too. Cause like, you know, she's, she's cool. She, she's very strong. A lot of the women in, in Robert Jordan series are very strong, like dominant <laughs> characters. Um, But there was not a whole. I I didn't feel a whole lot for Egwene, um, and and she's like Rand's love interest kind of, um, mm-hmm. and uh, but this whole sequence really gets to the bottom of her character quite, you know, brutally, um, and just that. I I I didn't forget it. You know, I listened to the book like while I was mowing the lawn and stuff on like one and a half times speed. Um, and I remember this part, uh, you know, because it was so powerful and so brutal and, um, intense. And, uh, you really feel for Gwaine, <laughs> um, and are very relieved when she is able to, um, be freed. I apologize if I missed like a huge moment or something. Um, Those are the three best moments in the book. Uh, the you know, hands, well, hands hands down. I don't know. I'd add the entire moment that is yeah, not played okay. out in the show at all. I think that's a great moment that yeah, is, uh, like an unimportant character, but like who at that point in the book you really care about him because you don't know that many characters. That's true. Um, but I. Nynaeve's accepted test. That when does that happen? Actually, in the series, that's in the second book. Okay, oh, is it? Because yeah. that's so the in the in the TV show, Nynaeve's accepted test was the best part of the entire show up until that point. I that agree. Was episode three of season one, season two, mm-hmm. was the best episode of the entire show up until that point. They com- they changed everything. Welcome, well, of it. While keeping it absolutely true and faithful <laughs> to, yeah, to the book, hmm. um, which is amazing that they could do that, and they, they've done that really well, especially in season two. Is like they've kept the characters faithful to who they are, while changing so many things. Um, it, it was the best part of the book of the show until Egwene was collared. Yeah, I agree. And the actress who uh, the the actress who plays Egwene went from a character like one I liked to my favorite actor in the show in that three episode piece. I and and the the TV show is doing this better than the books. The TV show is elevating the non Rand characters. From the beginning of the entire series, which yeah. it's clear when you read the book from the very first chapter who the main character is. It is unclear in the first season of the show until the last episode. Or second to last episode. And that's because they're elevating these other characters who should be elevated, in my opinion. Um, and they they nailed it with the queen. It it just gut punch. <laughs> yeah, I think you make a really good point. Um, that Rand is far and away the main character through the first two books, especially. Well, he's actually not, he doesn't appear much in the third book as a, a point of view character. But the first three books are very much Rand's story. Everything revolves around Rand, with you know, with some exceptions. Um, and one area that the, the show is really excelling in is um, uh, bringing those characters that are 
main characters in their own rights from books four on, they're making them main characters from the very mm-hmm. beginning. I think that's a strong point of the show for sure. All right, so let's talk about the third book. I have two things, so I'm trying to figure out which one I should share. If if you want me to go first, I'm thinking about the fight where Matt has the quarter staff. Oh, that's mine. Okay, uh, I'll choose a different one. I was gonna. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, so maybe well, we, start, clearly like, we have a universal favorite. Yeah, that means something. Yeah. Then. So yeah. All right. So, let me talk about that one. Yeah. Here, so okay, maybe you can jump it. into something else, Eric. So this uh, that scene is relatively inconsequential for the story as a whole, but it is just so fun and maybe in, inconsequential in my opinion, at least. But it, it's just fun to read because at, at this point in the story, Matt has had one moment where he is a redeemable character otherwise you're you read him as kind of a a moody and uninspired uh teenager um but he goes back to the white tower to be fully healed of his ties to the dagger and during his recovery he's weak he's tired he's exhausted he's supposed to be bedridden the Aes Sedai insist on him staying in his room but of course Matt you know scoundrel gambler <laughs> thrill seeking you know that he is uh won't listen to them so he goes out on he goes out into town he's checking out the local taverns seeing if he can find a good game of dice he stumbles into the warder training yard where two characters who are major characters throughout the series um Gawain and uh galad who are Elaine's brother and half-brother, royalty, who have been training with their swords since they were they could walk, and are considered to be the next great swordsmen of the age. They're training with the other warders. The other warders can't even beat them in a sword fight, and Matt uh, stumbles into the warder training yard and challenges them to a duel and they say no of course you're injured you can barely stand up and he says all right well let's put some money on it then (laughs) and i'll fight you with a quarter staff and they go no matt we don't want to take your money and so he ups the ante and they say all right fine we'll fight you two on one (laughs) and matt kicks their ass it's just a trouncing (laughs) it's a trouncing it's not even close they can't get anywhere close to him with one of their practice swords and he he knocks him down cold with his wooden quarter staff yeah and it is just this totally unimportant moment (laughs) right other than just to be cool and fun and demonstrate one that matt who has shown little to no prowess as uh, a fighter, little to no value as a character other than blowing the horn of a leer and being friends with our other characters. Mm-hmm. He really gets to have his own moment where he gets to show his carefree spirit in which he's willing to gamble uh, with, you know, put money and really hustle these two <laughs> noblemen out of their, yep. out of their, their golden crowns. Right? Purse. <laughs> yeah. Their golden crowns. Uh, it's <laughs> like, I'm envisioning like, you know, a guy pretending to be drunk at a bar, challenging people to play billiards, and then as soon as they put money on the table, then all of a sudden he stands up straight and he's a he's a pool shark. But mm-hmm. uh, Matt is just able to win this so thoroughly and in such a fun way that these two guys are so humbled. It's uh, it's just a really fun scene to watch or to read. It, we will get that scene. I hope we do. There's no way we won't. We haven't met either of those characters. He still has the attachment to the dagger. He's got to end back in a space. I, probably Tar- Tarvalon, but it could be a different space. It's a fan favorite. I hope we get it, but we might not. I was so happy to see Galad get punched in the gut and knocked out. I hated Galad. Both of them. Yeah. They're both kind of just kind of uppity noblemen. All the women mm-hmm. are making eyes at him. Robert Jordan's yeah, always yeah. talking about the doe eyes. It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, get, I get your point, man. All right, just... Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think all of us would be jealous of Galad. Oh yeah, yeah. that's. I, I'm not even jealous of him because I don't know. He's got nothing going on in his head. <laughs> like, I don't want to live like that. But that's besides the point. Um... <laughs> Jordan, share a knowing look. <laughs> I 
That's my favorite scene. Oh, that's one of my favorite scenes as well. I think that's a great choice. There, there are a couple other scenes that kind of came to my mind. One of them's with Matt at the end of the, the book. It's Rand is looking at the Stone of Tear. Mm-hmm. And he sees this character, this, this random like tiny dot like climbing it. Right? And he looks at it like, more closely, and it's Matt climbing the Stone of Tear with fireworks, m- like grumbling about Rand. Isn't he like, grumbling mm-hmm. about Rand at some point? Like, ah, I gotta save his you know, butt all the time, like, whatever. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah. And he ends up ex- like blowing a hole like, in right? the fortress. In the fortress. Yeah. As then the, while well, simultaneously the Aiel are pouring into it. And it's just a really. I think it's a really cool scene that I also want to see at some point, but I don't know if we'll get that version. We'll get some yeah. version of that, I think, but not in the same way. Um, but the other one I was going to share, um, which I think has, because we haven't brought up Perrin yet. Um, I think one of Perrin's really cool points is when he goes and saves, rescues there's multiple people actually. It was Gaul, Fael. It was the two of them. And then, yeah, it was, it was just the two of them. I think it was just the two of them. Um, from these cages um, that the White Cloaks had put them in. And then kind of goes berserk. Um, but like, both Gaul and Fael become. You, it, you can't then look at Perrin throughout the rest of this series without seeing Gaul and Fael. Like, they're by his side in some version throughout the rest of the series. And I think that's just a really, I think that's an important part for Perrin. Um, he also enters into the world of dreams for the first time. Um, Egwene does that too. That's where she first meets, she first meets the um, wise women. Yeah. The wise ones. Um, and so I think we really get the dream world in a different sense. Um, and you see those two very different paths going on. Uh, for me it's just that moment I don't even remember exactly where it is or exactly what they were talking about but it was the moment when um, Egwene and Nynaeve and Elaine are in the tower and there's some sort of conspiracy going on and they end up talking to Varen Sedai and I, maybe it's when Varen Sedai gives them the the ring that lets Elaine or lets a queen go into the dream world or something like that. Um, but just the moment of the, uh, you know, being in a, in a tower um, and sort of uncovering this truth and looking through dusty old tomes uh, and things that, that kind of was the turning point for me in, in enjoying the series. Um just because you're such a brown Aja. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, my, <laughs> I feel like if the average person who has not been exposed a lot, or who who is not like predisposed to like fantasy, or you know, uh, doesn't really have a reason to get into it, if you just like give them random snippets of Wheel of Time, or like show them something, they'll just roll their eyes. Like that's the, the default reaction when people start like saying weird names and like like <laughs> you know hap- some of the things you guys have been talking about I was just like well I just don't know that uh, I don't know what those words mean uh, <laughs> but like guilty you know and, and I mean there's there's a sense where I think some some fans can turn that into like a way to gatekeep um, you know like mm. policing pronunciation I really appreciate Eric that you do not do that uh, and, and you, Jordan, you haven't done that. Um, and, but I feel like, I, I feel like those kinds of fans are really just a vocal minority. Um, mm. in my personal experience, like most people are kind of open about sharing the things that they love and tolerant, but, uh, you know, you can look at things like that and, and the, the, the kind of clunky dialogue <laughs> that Jordan has sometimes is just kind of like, you know, it, it's it's what kind of was a sticking point for me in the first book. Um, 
is the sort of like you look you like the cover art um mm -hmm. is like my I, I was trying to think of like trying to encapsulate my reaction to the wheel of time in general and it would be like i start rolling my eyes and then i catch in the middle of it and like start looking at it and taking it a little more seriously I'd be like oh <laughs> i notice this now i see it's sub actually because <laughs> it's like you know it's kind of like the magic of harry potter um of just imagining some a new world imagining something else um doing something new um just like don quixote which is my favorite the, my favorite <laughs> novel is is just he just decides that he's going to be a knight for no reason um and and that's kind of like the whimsy of of fantasy and and i mean fantasy as a genre really captures that sort of whimsical feeling of wanting to go on an adventure mm -hmm. and and that's what the wheel of time really is to me is is that part of myself that plays imaginary games in the backyard with sticks and uh you know fights with a quarter staff and <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah defends the the armies of light and uh i guess i'm kind of ashamed to admit that it took me two and a half books to find that part of myself <laughs> in this context but um you know i'm glad i did well yeah I, I think that that's that's why i read fantasy i think that's the draw of a fantasy series in general is yeah. to read yep. something that isn't Mm -hmm. And just wondering, like, what could be to be to go on a journey to experience something that is isn't real, isn't actually possible in our world, and yet, you know, kind of the escapist nature of it take us take us to a different place and let us meet some other some other heroes, some other villains, some other you know struggles that are so far removed from you know the monotony of life or the sadness or or brokenness of of the real world let's let's read something let's let's read some examples of some other heroes struggling and succeeding and struggling and failing and picking themselves up and trying again mm -hmm. um that to me is is why the fantasy genre is is my go-to that i've read more fantasy novels than i've read any other <laughs> any other books yeah um and uh, it just keeps me coming back. Mm. What do you want? Do we do final thoughts now? What do you want? What do you want to do? Yeah. Well, um, I did. There was one question. I don't know if we should do it or not. When I when I read Wheel of Time, I I pay attention to the women, and I'm not sure what to think because usually my source for like how women are treated in a particular book or show or something or movie is my wife. Um, but, uh, she hasn't really interacted that much with Wheel of Time. And I was wondering, Eric, did you ask Melanie about it? Yeah, or? well, I did. So yeah. I, I did ask her about like the, in the show, the way that women are portrayed and the show and the books are different at this point. Yeah. I think the books like finally get it right in like books 11 to 14. I think it takes a while it's a I think there's a lot of issues with the book's portrayal of women, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the reasons why I'm so enjoying the TV show, um, because this is really a world that's dominated by female characters. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was asking my wife, because Hunter, you shared with us, like, hey, like, you know, can you ask your wife about like the way that women are portrayed in this in this show? And if it's like an issue or they get it comes up with issues, my wife's response was like, hey, like. She didn't think about it, mm -hmm. which, at least in my hearing of that, is like a positive on the note of the way female characters are treated. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. But before I, well, I'll add one more thing and then I'll stop there. In the books, if you looked like at a breakdown of how much char characters get airtime, there's a change at what was it, book seven or eight? Where, yeah. where it goes from male dominated to female dominated, or like um, in the book series. Mm -hmm. um, but you get that from the beginning of this of this show. 
I don't know. What do you? Anything come to your mind? I know you and your wife have watched the show. And... Yeah, yeah. It's funny you bring that up because um, that's that's something that um, we we have talked about both. You know, Megan and I. So Megan has read the first few books as well. That'll be a few years ago, and she's you know uh, a big fan of the show. And Eric, I think we might have talked about this in you know our book club discussions, but. Um, some of the, the writing and, and the way that Robert Jordan wrote the female characters in the earlier books, it's not the strongest examples of his writing. Um, this is a world that has, is set up to be, you know, politically dominated by women, which is, you know, a refreshing and, and, and cool take on the world because it doesn't really exist in the fantasy genre otherwise. And yet even as part of that, it's like that the way that so many of the female characters are written kind of incorporates that and takes it a little bit too far as Mm -hmm. if that's the only trait that those women have as being kind of strong and imposing and more, more dominant characters. And in the earlier books, especially kind of lacking depth otherwise, Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a shortcoming that Robert Jordan has in the in kind of the first half of the series. Um, it's not, it's, you know, acknowledging my own bias. That's not something I picked up on when I read the books when I was 13. Same. Yeah. But it's something I picked up on in re-engaging with the series mm-hmm. as an adult and something that Megan picked up on, Megan, you know, my wife picked up on immediately and we have have talked about yeah um so i think that that is something that he robert jordan gets better at Mm -hmm. as the series goes on at fleshing out the characters giving them traits other than uh you know being kind of just dominant forces um you know playing out the way the world is set up in their you know interpersonal dynamics Mm -hmm. um and you know one (laughs) one thing that megan observed that i had didn't even notice is that you know, in addition to always knowing what characters are wearing in every scene, you always know when a female character puts her arms underneath her breasts. Like the way that <laughs> that, that phrase is repeated like multiple times throughout the book series. Tug his braid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or tugging the braid. And and I did, I get, when I when I read it, I didn't really think anything of that. But it, you know, I don't. That might not be the best example of writing. I don't know if it hurts the books or, or what you would call that, but it, mm-hmm. it is definitely a thing that is certainly not necessary as a descriptor, but mm-hmm. it is yeah. a weird writing quirk that he has in, um, <laughs> could have been improved on. And on the TV show side, they have leaned very heavily into the idea of pillow friends that are yeah. brought up in the books. That's true. As they, like, which, like, the idea of, like, uh, novices, like, whoever their bunkmate or the person in the room next to them, like, was called their... Yeah. Like, their pillow friend is was the language within the White Tower. And, and what that has been translated as in the TV show, and, and many fans translate it this way, uh, but I think it was not until very, very, very late in the series that people did. But what the TV show is saying is that means that all of them have like intimate sexual relationships with each other or not all, but most of them. And that's, that's not a, like from the book thing that. Yeah. There's, a, there's a level of implication there, but it's definitely not stated explicitly in the, and the show has chosen to kind of lean into that implication which, yeah. and which maybe doesn't mean anything about like the way that female characters are treated, treated, but I don't know. Yeah. And, um, I I do think that, you know, apart from that, that is something that the show has improved on from the books is the depiction of female characters and giving them depth and giving them, uh, you know, more character traits other than just being kind of domineering. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, even uh, so I didn't think Leandrin's whole son thing was necessary, but even that was kind of interesting of. Yeah, you made her like her. You made yeah. you made you understand her and like her a little bit more mm-hmm. as a character. Yeah, even as you disliked more, her, more three dimensional. Yeah, and like 
Morgane's whole backstory, like, it's talked about, but it's not, like, it's clear that Morgane, sorry, Morgane and her sister, and, like, it's clear that Morgane, you know that Morgane's a person of power and influence, and, mm-hmm. you know. Who's Morgane it's, again? Morgane. Oh, my gosh, who am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm just comparing com- Morgase and Moraine. I've created a new character. Morgane. Or is Morgane also a character? Get this man some more scotch. <laughs> I'm gonna... Like Moraine's entire backstory in the, the TV show is like is a way of I think actually not giving her character more depth, but drawing her out as an important character longer in the show than, yeah. than I think is necessary. Um but like her thing with Suan, like does give more like emotional like I mean that whole piece with Suan is entirely fabricated. Um like like especially like the fight before they go in the way gate. Like that that doesn't yeah. exist. Mm. Um and yet it, it gives you more emotional care about the characters. It gives it more more weight, more emotional mm-hmm. weight. Mm. For sure. Even though I wouldn't have written it and don't think it's necessary. But the, I'm getting off topic from your yeah. original question, Hunter. I'm sorry. What a surprise. Yeah. I think we we covered about as much as we can as uh, three men. We don't want to mansplain too much. Hunter, I had a question for you. Um, so as we're kind of t- towards the end of this episode, um, Entering into this episode, you were planning and and you have taken a space of asking Jordan and I questions and, and giving us space to talk, and you've definitely shared a bit, quite a bit as well. Um, has anything that Jordan and I have shared impacted or changed some of your views about Wheel of Time? You've heard me talk about Wheel of Time a lot, <laughs> but you have never been in the space where I've kind of discussed it with somebody else and like. I don't know. I'm interested to hear if you have any thoughts from that. I I think it has um, built a, like a clearer image in a, a, a clearer image in my mind of like your journey with Wheel of Time and a lot of people's journey with Wheel of Time. Um, like when when you and Jordan were sharing about. Uh, how you started reading these books young and you they stayed with you for decades um and you know that is a really you know that's why they've shaped you um because they've been there <laughs> at you know it's been in your hands for you know over a decade of your life um, at you know, while you've been experiencing all the pressures and changes and highs and lows of everything, um, you've had these books along with you, and I, I think it. I mean, we we've talked a lot on the podcast about how we don't we we want to treat art not as a product, um, as it is often treated, um in our economy and I mean I think that when I think about myself and the things that I really love a lot of the things that I really love are things that I found young Um, and that you know a lot of our our musical taste and things can be traced back to middle school (laughs) Um, and and yes my tastes have changed and I find new things that I love Um, but you know those old things that I loved then and that I still love now are are always going to be really special because because art and and stories in particular you know once you get past a certain threshold of like coherency and uh, you know it's it's really difficult to judge them objectively um and that you know the the fingerprints that they leave on us are kind of you know it's it's really hard to quantify them 
Just like it's really hard to quantify all the ways that our parents have have shaped us <laughs> because you just don't know. You just don't know yeah. all of the different ways. Um Yeah. I, I don't know if that actually answered your question or not, but um it is a journey, yeah. you know. Read reading a series like this and having something that impacts you, you know, for uh for a decade, two decades, it's um to have it be something that you like care about for that long. It's a it's a fun journey to go on. There are many books I read when I was thirteen that I have not reread. Yeah. <laughs> Or wouldn't would bring to this ep this podcast as a half an episode mm -hmm. or a grab bag, like. But I wouldn't spend time, yeah, deep in conversation about it. And actually, one of the things that surprised me is just the depth of the conversation we got to today. Um, because we we could talk breadth, you know, about you know, as many different things that we want to. But I, I think that there's some real implications of this book series that. that have more to offer than a fun thing to read. Mm. Um, whether you're a you know, 13 year old boy or an adult. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But they are really fun to read. Too. They are really fun. To read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any, any final thoughts on the wheel of time? On, on this discussion, on the first three books, the first two seasons of the show. I don't know. Um, might end up cutting it, but I can't help like compare Game of, Game of Thrones to Wheel of Time because I've read A Song of Ice and Fire and I watched the TV show. I guess the one thing I'll say to not get too off track and tack too much onto the end of the episode is that I am very glad that Wheel of Time is a finished series that they are making a TV show of because I've given up hope on Winds of Winter at this point. George, I know you're not listening, but do whatever you want, I guess. Because <laughs> that's, that's what you've been doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, in, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there's a quick like, story about a poet who like lives in the middle of like a tree and like wrote this poetry that really deeply impacted the entire history of all beings. Um, and then years, I mean, thousands of years later, tra time travel was created and then people kept visiting him and you know, in his hut and finally was like, yo, like if people keep visiting me, I'm going to go back and go into the future with them and like live this lush, lavish life. <laughs> and so he goes in the future, and then the books are never written. Mm. Uh, and so they sent him back into the past to copy what he had already written. And then he goes back into the future. It's this whole convoluted <laughs> thing, and he like you know lives his whole life. But I kind of get that feeling of like George R. R. Martin has been paid out for everything he's done. Why finish it? <laughs> well, yeah, he can't just leave his characters there, man. I mean, like. Dance. He will. Like book five, just you just gonna leave Danny there? Like, I mean, come on. Sorry. Um, this so the show. One thing I've enjoyed about the show Wheel of Time, especially in the second season. And I said in the first season, but I really mean the second season. Like, if you were to stop it at any point, it doesn't feel like Game of Thrones. It doesn't feel like Tolkien. It doesn't feel like Narnia. It doesn't feel like Aragon. It doesn't feel like Shannara. It really feels like Wheel of Time. Yeah. Which is a really hard thing, I think, to capture. Like, like the, the set design does it. The Seanchin, the way that they're dressed, terrifying. Like, it's, you know, the music, you know, the, the costuming, you know, the, the way they speak. The, ch the choice to speak the old tongue and the way that's spoken, like it, it feels like Wheel of Time. And that's before the, the TV show first aired, uh, Jordan and I were in a conversation with a, a group of guys around the series. And one of the guys brought up something that has 
impacted the way I'm watching this show. And what he said is the way he was approaching it was as another weaving of the wheel. It's not the same. It's another weaving of the same time period, the same wheel. And that has given me the, op- the ability to watch the show and enjoy it. At times, even more so because it's uh, changing what the books were about. Uh, and, and that's a special thing to do that. Like what I wanted was I wanted the characters to feel like the characters and have similar story arcs. And I wanted to feel like the wheel of time. And I had, I was pretty open to other things and the show, especially in season two, it's, it's delivering that. Um, and it's making me want to reread the series. Yeah, I agree with that. I would say uh, as a kind of a final or closing thought for me too, that, um, if it's not obvious, I've, I've loved these books for a long time. And so it's really special and really fun to be, to see them adapted into a TV show, uh, in the way that it is. And I know that a lot of fans, it's, it, a lot of fans don't see it the same way. A lot of fans are, you know, book purists or they're, you know, unhappy with the way the adaptation is unfolding or whatnot, but I'm still just trying to appreciate the ride and just to see something that I've envisioned in my head, these, these scenes, these characters, I've envisioned them in my head for so long, just seeing how kind of just seeing them come to life is, is just a fun mm-hmm. process, something to witness and, and participate in. And then, uh, you know, driving additional interest and being able to discuss and talk about it. It's, it's, it's been a fun experience over the last couple of years as this a- adaptation has, has taken place. And, um, I didn't really think I'd ever see the day, to be honest. I, <laughs> I, I thought that the Wheel of Time, among other fantasy series, were kind of unadaptable. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dune. So I, I, yeah, Dune is another good example, you know. And I, I hope the series goes the distance just because it's there are so many scenes that are later in the series that I would love to see uh, adapted into into that medium i just think that would be really fun to witness and sure it's not going to be exactly how i picture it it's not going to be exactly how robert jordan wrote it but i still think it's going to be really fun and i think if fans of the show were to see those scenes they would blow their minds like in a way that like would i want them to just have the funding to get that far because it's not going to let you down yeah (laughs) it's it's there's with how good season two was, like they'd have to have a huge drop off in quality of directing. Cause yeah. the actors are getting better and they're only going to get better as the show goes on. The set design is stunning. And so there'd have to be, and the, the content's already there. Got that Amazon money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Putting it to work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wheels of power, right? That's it's <laughs> crossover event. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's nice to approach a series where I don't really have a lot at stake. For me, like like I have this is a new thing. I'm I'm liking the books more. If anything, watching this the show has made me want to read the books more. So I, one, I want to stay ahead of the show. Um, it's not it's not a race, but I'd like to stay ahead and uh experience it in the book for the first time but um i don't know i i approach tv differently than i i used to especially fantasy tv i gave up on choreography like fight choreography i just was like i'm just gonna let it happen on the screen like i (laughs) because fantasy fight choreography is just like armor is made of paper it's just doesn't do anything and uh but just just being along for the ride and and seeing it happen is uh is fun yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. jordan thanks for joining thanks for having me you (laughs) i've really enjoyed the discussion i know we've been here for a long time this has been really fun yeah i've been excited for this episode since we started the podcast
Cause... I've been excited about the prospect of uh, <laughs> getting to participate. This is uh, it takes us some time, but this is we really cool. Yeah. Well, in a couple of years, if you want to talk about books four through six, you just give, give me a holler. I'll come right back. It's not on my uh, time scale for this one. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, I probably will reread four, five, six because yeah. I'm just. I might want to give them a a, give them a lesson or something, for sure. Mm-hmm. Do you have a quote that you want to? You in fact have some artwork. Oh yeah, and it doesn't need to be from the. I do. Um, do you do I have to say it or do you want me to like send it to you? I gotta read it. We look up the exact quote. Because it, it's, yeah, it's a Matt quote, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a quote from book five, The Fires of Heaven, from my favorite character in the book, uh, Matt Cawthon. Um, after a battle is over, he's kind of just reliving that moment and reflecting on the state of his life and how he's feeling in that moment. And the quote um, is actually on a banner that my wife got me that's hanging in my living room. And the quote go, reads, almost dead yesterday, maybe dead tomorrow, but alive, gloriously alive today. Mm-hmm.